go ahead and get started. I'm Corinne, um, and we're going to just go ahead and try to get through as much content tonight as we possibly can. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of the, the, each unit, just focusing on the most difficult concepts and the ones I anticipate you're going to see tomorrow. Um, and then I'll also try to hit some sample questions too. So I'm going to just be speaking as quickly as possible to give you as much information as possible so that you feel prepared for tomorrow, especially those of you who are also taking AP Gov. So let's get started with the basics, unit one. This was the first unit, and it's also the one that just kind of reviews a lot of what you saw in Chem 1. So what we're going to focus on instead are the topics that I anticipate you're going to use the most um, on tomorrow's exam. So let's start with moles and molar mass. So when you are doing these conversions, and you will absolutely be doing these conversions in both the MCQs and the FRQs, so make sure that you are doing it in the correct way. So it's just an easy thing to remember. If you are starting with moles, you're always going to multiply, whether you're looking for the conversion from grams to moles or moles to particles. Think starting with moles, I multiply. If I'm looking for moles, therefore, I'm going to divide. Okay, just simple, simple tips for you tonight to get you ready for tomorrow. Mass spec is another one of those new topics that you saw in unit one. I anticipate that you'll either have an FRQ on mass spec or photoelectron spectroscopy. So just know how to read this mass spec diagram. Know that we're looking at the average atomic mass of the element and trying to identify those elements. So let's look at a sample problem. So with this one, if um, you're looking at this and you see that your relative abundances are above 100, just breathe. Okay, you're just, your goal is to see the percentages of each of these isotopes. And then just use that to do a normal calculation as you normally would for the average atomic mass. So looking at this one, let's say I had these two isotopes. Um, I have 100 for my relative abundance or my intensity for the isotope with a mass of 11 out of 25, 125 total. So just find the mass, multiply that by the percent abundance and add those together as you normally would. So we'd say that this has a an average atomic mass of 10.8 and it's most likely to be identified as boron, All right? So these are the other topics that you see in um, unit one. Make sure you feel comfortable with percent composition and the empirical versus molecular formulas. This is the easiest way to remember this, percent to mass, mass to mole, divide by small, multiply by whole. What that means is you can take a percentage and quickly change that into masses. Whenever we're comparing different elements, we can't do that on a grams to grams basis, always has to be in moles to moles. So with finding the empirical formula, you gotta make sure you're getting to the moles to moles ratios and then dividing to get the simplest whole number ratio between those. If you then need to take that and change that into a molecular formula, Remember to just find your empirical molar mass. You can then compare that to the total molar mass of the molecular formula and see how many times you need to multiply that formula to obtain the molecular formula. All right, I'm speaking a mile a minute. I can't, I don't see the chat or anything like that. Um, so please let me know if I need to slow down or um, if anything comes up. Um, I'm just gonna keep going though. So these are the different types of problems you might see. Combustion analysis and hydrate analysis are the ones I anticipate you might see on your FRQ section. Um, so just know that there's an extra step there where you have to take the data and then change that to find the grams of specific elements for combustion analysis. So you have to take your mass of carbon dioxide, find the masses of carbon and masses of oxygen in that. With hydrates, you'll have to use um, the lab data. So you'll have to just do some simple subtraction there. All right, so let's continue on. This is the main topic from unit one that you're definitely, okay, that you are definitely going to want to be really familiar with. So Coulomb's law, the joke is, if you remember to, to mention Columbic attraction, that you will get a five, right? Not quite the case, but this is a very, very important topic that you absolutely need to be aware of for tomorrow. Okay, so Coulomb's law, basically, right, the charge, the force of attraction between two charged particles is directly related to the magnitude of charge. So whether that's plus one or plus two, um, just the charge of that ion, and it's inversely related to the distance between those ions. So the larger the magnitude of charge and the closer those ions are together, the stronger, stronger those attractive forces are going to be. And that's going to impact their molecular forces. That's going to impact everything, right? So that which will then also impact um, their physical properties like melting point, boiling point. So if you have small ions tightly packed together, those are going to have really strong forces of attraction. It's going to take a lot of energy to break those forces in between those small atoms. All right. So relating that back, um, we also need to talk a little bit about ionization energy. So ionization energy is just going to be the amount of energy required to remove an electron. So Coulomb's law says that the closer the electrons are to the nucleus, the more difficult they are to, re to remove. And this is the idea of nuclear effective charge. Okay, so the more positively charged protons you have in the nucleus, 
the more energy that's going to be required to remove those electrons. Because I don't say this, but opposites attract, right? So if you have a lot of positive charge in your nucleus, all of the negatively charged electrons are going to be pulled in towards that nucleus and it's going to take a lot more energy to rip them off um, from that attraction. So let's look at a sample problem here. So let's say we're given ionization energies. We're asked to identify this third element. So we know we are in period three and the periods are the rows on the periodic table. Um, so we are given sodium. And if you look, there's a significant jump between the first ionization energy versus the second. And that's gonna indicate that we're moving from the valence electrons to an inner shell electron. So what you wanna do is you wanna find out where that jump occurs with this mystery element here. And that's going to tell us how many valence electrons it has. And again, we know it's in the third row. So looking at this, you will quickly see there's a big difference between the third and the fourth ionization energies. So that indicates that this element is going to have three valence electrons. So use your given periodic table, look at that third row, and you will see that aluminum is going to have three valence electrons. So I would anticipate that this would be aluminum. So that's how you would approach just a simple ionization um, energy problem. Uh, electron configuration is also in unit one. If you still don't have this down, don't spend a lot of time on this. You might see one multiple choice question, maybe one point on the FRQ related to this. So if you don't have it, don't stress about it at this point. Um, let's see. And then photoelectron spectroscopy or PES. This is the other technique that comes up in unit one that was probably new to you. Um, thankfully, although it looks intimidating, it's not too hard to decipher. Just remember that at the origin, that's essentially where the nucleus of the atom is. And then out from there is where we find all of the electrons with the furthest peak representing the valence electrons. So you can use that. And then the relative intensity or the height of these peaks is going to tell us how many electrons we have in each of those orbitals. So you can use those to then identify the element given. And I, I would anticipate you might see this as a short answer question on the FRQ section. Um, when it comes to periodic trends, know that everything is related to atomic radius relative size of the atom. So as the atomic radius increases, those electrons are further from the nucleus. So therefore, it takes less energy to remove them. So atomic radius increases, ionization energy decreases. Again, because the further those electrons are, let's go back to Coulomb's law, right? So the further they are, the larger the distance, therefore, the smaller the attractive forces between those particles. Um, other trends you need to know, electronegativity and electron affinity. So make sure to spend some time just looking through those trends and not memorizing the arrows, memorizing, learning what this actually relates to. So if you can think it all relates back to the size of the atom, the smaller the atom, the closer those electrons are to the positively charged nucleus. Therefore, the harder it is to remove electrons and the higher the ionization energy. Everything goes back to the atomic radius. Um, all right, and this is just showing that, and the buzzword here, again, is effective nuclear charge. So the greater the magnitude of protons that you have in the nucleus, the more those electrons are pulled in towards that, the more they are attracted towards the center of the atom nucleus. All right, moving on to unit two. So unit two is another one that reviews a lot of what you already saw um, in chem one. The things that keep popping up and everyone keeps asking about though are resonance, formal charge and bond hybridization. So let's spend some time looking at that tonight. So you should know the difference between ionic and covalent. The big thing here is also being able to identify polar versus nonpolar bonds. So you're looking for differences in electronegativity. So for example, carbon and hydrogen do not have a significant difference, therefore they are not polar. Don't make that mistake, right? The carbon to hydrogen bond is nonpolar versus the um, oxygen to hydrogen bond. That's going to be a, um, a polar bond. All right. So if you are looking at the overall molecule and trying to determine whether it's polar, if it has polar bonds, but it is symmetrical, then the overall molecule will be asymmetrical. So essentially, all of those polar bonds are pulling at each other equally. It's like a, it's the best case scenario tug of war, right? Where everyone's just tugging at the same, at the same strength. And Kind of cancels out. Right? It's a simplified idea, but if you can keep, keep that in your head, it helps you understand um, polarity of molecules. All right, um, let's see. So if you have an asymmetrical molecule like you see here, we have three carbons, to, uh, sorry, three carbon hydrogen bonds and one to chlorine. This bond here, the carbon to chlorine is going to be polar. Therefore, the overall molecule is going to have that dipole and it is going to be polar. All right, so let's look at IMFs in depth in the next unit, considering they they account for 22% of your exam tomorrow. Um, and then let's talk a little bit more. This lattice energy relates back to Coulomb's law. Okay, so the 
the larger the magnitude of charge, the stronger the force is. Also, the smaller those ions are, the more closely packed they can be, and therefore the stronger the attractive forces are going to be. Um, all right, so let's do a sample problem. Which would have a higher melting point? Would we anticipate that sodium chloride or sodium fluoride does? Um, and remembering that lattice energy is based on the magnitude of charge and the spacing between ions. And Corinne, I just wanted to jump in and say, first of all, thank you. I feel like I'm getting, I got all of you in one in eight minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and there's an eight feet cam, right? So everyone in the chat, and I've got my eye on the chat for you. So I want to feed this back to the group. We've got our question, which would have the higher melting, melting point, NACL or NAF? And everyone's going to take their best guess. So this, that's it, right? One of these two has to have a, a higher melting point unless it's a trick question and they're tied. So I want to hear in the chat, there's a few second delay. Um, as we do that, Corinne, um, I do want to um, real quick ask this question. You've got nine units in AP Chem. There's ions and oxidation reduction reactions and all sorts of trauma that we've experienced over the course of the year. If it is, I'm on the East Coast, it's 8.13 Eastern time. This exam is at 12 o'clock local time tomorrow. Of the nine units, mm -hmm. and I, let's say if I said, oh, it's too much to study them all, I want to pick two or three. Which two or three should I pick and, and why for AP Chem? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a lot of chemistry teachers will tell you too, if you know the basics, that's enough right away to score a three on this exam. Um, so I would focus in on, definitely focus in on unit three, the next one, um, intermolecular forces, because those tie into everything else. And the ideas are relatively simple. Um, so if you, if you have a good understanding of those, you are likely to do well tomorrow. The other one I would focus on is not as easy or straightforward. That's going to be um, unit eight, which is going to be acids and bases. Um, that's a difficult unit, but there are so many great resources. So even if you don't feel great about it right now, if you spend an hour tonight, um, working on that. Hopefully you can get at least a few of those concepts to click, spend time with titrations. You will absolutely see that tomorrow. Knock on wood, right? Now that I've said that you won't, um, but nine times out of 10, you will spend some time with that. So you feel confident in that. Great. What a great answer. And then for tonight, we, we did our drive-by of unit one. We're in unit two. We're going to have some time to get to unit three. How many more units do you think we, we have realistically have time to get to tonight that we want to focus on in our session? Um, well, we can skip ahead to the more difficult units too, um, or I could just hit a few more. I'm sorry, I was ready to like do a quick fire review as quickly as possible. <laughs> no, it's amazing. And, and there's a large group here in the chat and everyone, let's go ahead and give some um, rounds of applause um, emojis and other things for our, some people don't like acids and bases, uh, for our presenter, Corinne. And if you like this uh, video, press that like button, go ahead, subscribe to our channel. We have um, a lot of videos here for a lot of subjects. Um, briefly, I do want to say it, it's a, it's nearly unanimous, Corinne, in the chat that NAF is the correct answer, but some people are giving different reasons, right? NAF because the bond is stronger and harder to break. Uh, NAF has a smaller atomic radius. Mm -hmm. NAF, since it's smaller than CL, What's the, I'm hoping the correct answer is NAF for the people it in this is, room. Yeah. Why? What's the best reason? Awesome. Yeah. So you want to be really careful, right? You don't want to say, oh, because F is smaller. Um, you want to make sure you're using the right language, right? It still matters in chemistry. Um, so with this, you want to tie back to Coul Coulomb's law right? And say that the ion is going to be, so the atomic radius is going to be smaller, right? Therefore, those ions are going to be more tightly packed in and the lattice energy is going to be higher, right? So because that energy is higher, it's going to require more energy to break those interactions, um, which I think I have on the next slide. Let's see. Yeah. So they're both, the magnitude is not going to be the hint there, right? Because they're both halogens. They're both going to have a charge of minus one. Um, so it's all about that the fluoride ion is going to be significantly smaller. Okay. So relate back to Coulomb's law, which is why I hit on that earlier. You absolutely need to mention Coulomb's law tomorrow when you're taking that FRQ. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. And it sounds like you guys are already in a really good position. Um, so let's, let's go forward. Let's see what else we can cover here. Um, so, all right. So there were a lot of requests for resonance and formal charge. Let's just spend a few minutes looking at that. So formal charge, I like giving hints for easy ways to remember things because you have enough on your minds already. And chances are many of you are taking AP Gov and are also studying for that tonight. So anytime I can give you something easy to help you out tomorrow, I will absolutely do that. Um, so the formal charge is going to be equal to the valence electrons minus the dots minus the sticks. So what I mean by that is if I'm trying to calculate the formal charge on a single atom, I'm going to look at its valence electrons according to 
into its location on the periodic table, minus any lone pairs I see on that atom, minus any of the sticks, which are the bonds to that atom. So for example, in the structure A here, if we want to calculate the formal charge of that carbon atom, carbon is going to have four valence electrons. We do not have any lone pairs or dots on there. So that's just minus zero. So four minus zero. And then we have four bonds. So that's going to be a formal charge of zero, which is ideal. We want to have our formal charges as close to zero as possible, making sure that the overall molecule is as close to the given charge um, or zero. And that's going to tell us which which um, structure is most ideal. All right, so this is just showing you all those formal charges. Hopefully that helped a little bit. Um, and if we wanted to choose between these three resonance structures, you'd look for the one that has the lowest um, formal overall formal charges. Um, Vesper, so a lot of people have asked for some practice with molecular geometry. Unfortunately, you have to memorize these. Um, if you just look for the patterns, this is a great chart because it kind of shows you how they're all related. But with molecular geometry, take the time to draw that Lewis structure, because what you are looking for is not only the number of bonds, but also those extra electrons. So be careful with that. Um, all right, then hybridization. This was another thing that keeps kept coming up. Um, so hybrid orbitals, what you need to know, it's like mixing paint. Okay, if I have SP hybridization, I have some blue paint, I have some pink paint. When I mix those together, you still see hints of both of those original colors. The same thing happens with bond hybridization. The nice thing is it's really easy to actually determine these. It's just a matter of counting, all right? So if I'm looking at, let's say beryllium, um, beryllium chloride here, I'm just counting the number of bonds and lone pairs on that central atom. So it's beryllium is bonded to two atoms of chlorine. That's just going to have a total, um, of two. So that's just going to be SP hybridization, assuming that each of these has a superscript of one. So it really is just a matter of adding these up. So for example, boron trifluoride or boron, um, yeah, boron trifluoride, we're going to have three atoms bonded to boron, right? That's going to have a total of three. So that S has a one, we don't show it, um, SP2 for a total of three. So it's just a matter of looking for those patterns and counting those up. If I wanted to, I then just practice with this. Um, I'm looking at penguinone in honor of my friend, AP Bio penguins. So looking at carbon one, I'm just counting those bonds and lone pairs. This carbon is going to have three bonds. The double bound only counts as one domain. So it's going to have SP2 hybridization versus looking at carbon three on the far right side, you have those three atoms um, of hydrogen and then one carbon to carbon bond, four bonds total, that's gonna have sp3 hybridization. The other thing that comes up with this is sigma versus pi. This is so easy guys, so easy, right? So every single bond has one sigma bond. Um, if you have a double bond, it has in addition to that one sigma, it has a pi bond. If you have a triple bond, you're going to have a sigma bond and two pi bonds. So looking at this overall molecule, I could quickly count up the number of sigma and pi bonds. So each sigma is going to count, um, yeah, sorry, each bond counts as one sigma and then the double again have the sigma plus the pi. So if you count these up, you should get 11 sigma bonds and three pi bonds, okay? So I think those are, yeah, those are the last topics here. Um, let's spend some time with unit three and then let's scoot forward and keep an eye on the time. It's 820. Let's scoot forward to some of the more tricky units just to spend some time going over those tricks. So everything in this unit is important just because you're going to see it. It, it just connects in with everything else. So it's good to start with the basics and really understand each of these interactions so that you can describe it well. Um, so ion dipole interaction, this is going to occur when you dissolve an ionic substance in water. So it's gonna be your strongest, um, a strongest interaction just due to that electrostatic um, force. So versus hydrogen bonding, be careful with hydrogen bonding. So know that not only do you have to have an electronegative nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, hydrogen also has to be in a polar bond, right? So if you have carbon bonded to hydrogen, there's not a polar bond there. So that hydrogen atom is not going to de develop that partial positive. There's not going to be an interaction. Okay. So you have to not only have an electronegative, um, I, you have to have the difference in electronegativity with the hydrogen, as well as the nitrogen, oxygens, or fluorines and other molecules. So be careful with that. Dipole-dipole um, is going to be interactions between polar molecules. And the thing to know with this is that the strength of this interaction is going to increase as polarity increases. And then LDF, London Dispersion Forces, a Van der Waals force, like giving you all the different ways that we can refer to these things, because sometimes with chemistry, just the vocab, right? 
<laughs> is the trickiest part. Um, so van der Waals forces are just due to these temporary dipoles. So the electrons are moving randomly, which means randomly they're going to congregate in one section, which means you're going to randomly have a ne partial negative on one side and a partial positive where they are not. Um, so the strength is going to increase with molecular size due to the greater polarizability of that electron cloud. So know that, that the larger the molecule is, the stronger its LDF or London dispersion forces are going to be. Um, all right, so if you were asked to identify IMF, these are the questions I would ask myself, um, focusing on whether there are ions versus polar molecules. And then if you have polar bonds, are there hydrogens and oxygens, nitrogens and fluorines? Note that everything is going to experience London dispersion forces to some extent, um, but the size of the molecule is going to determine the strength of those IMFs. And again, just mentioning what I just mentioned, because this is another buzzword right associated with this curriculum um so the polarizability of that electron cloud just shows you um how likely everything is to experience these interactions and how strong those interactions are going to be all right so let's do another practice problem so in this one i think this is from last year's frq actually so we have two organic molecules here they look very similar um, but we are actually given the, the inter, uh, intermolecular forces here. So we know that both of these experience LDF, dipole-dipole interactions, and hydrogen bonding. However, the melting point of salicylic acid or aspirin is higher than that of the other structure. So the question is why? Why? What do you notice here? I don't know if we have time to do this one in the chat too. Is that okay? We do. Yeah, let's okay, take awesome. a moment, everyone. And, and hi, everyone. I'm John from Marco Learning. Thank you so much for joining. We've got just about 360 people here with us um, cramming the <laughs> night before the exam. Um, so if you have not yet um, had a, a chance to say hello or press that like button on this video, go ahead and do that. And we want to hear your answer to this question. Explain why the melting point of salicylic acid is higher than that of methyl salicylate. Did I say that right? Yeah, that was great. I'm okay, impressed. Make it up. Great. So we're all <laughs> going to take a moment and just pause on this. And everyone, where we are, we just breeze through units one and two. And Corinne, you were saying earlier, unit three is a critical unit, right? Even if we can't finish everything, um, this is an amazing place to spend a good amount of time. And what I'm seeing in the chat, by the way, I'm seeing a wave of answers. Salicylic acid is two sites for hydrogen bonding. Salicylic acid has greater mass, so it is more polarizable electron cloud. There's more hydrogen bonds, more hydrogen bonding. Um, salicylic acid has more hydrogen bonds, two sites of hydrogen bonding. Are yes. we on the right track? I'm that, getting that, that is absolutely the right track. So I like that someone mentioned that it, it has a higher molar mass. It doesn't actually. So be careful with that. Um, if you look at the other compound, it has an additional carbon. It is due to the two locations for hydrogen bonding. So looking at that um, oxygen on the far upper right side, um, you will see, I guess I could use a pointer. I haven't even pulled that up yet. Sorry. You can see that that is bonded to hydrogen. So that is going to have a good spot. That is going to be a good spot for hydrogen bonding, as well as the one that's um, Kind of across from it versus if you're looking at the other compound that is bonded to carbon that is not going to be um, a polar bond and therefore there's only one location for hydrogen bonding so that is absolutely right so there you go one point already tomorrow awesome Wonderful. all right let's yeah and just um, one quick question i have real quick corinne and i know where i'm slowing you down in all your units you're good. Go, go faster um real quick <laughs> these slides is there any way that we have an ability to share these out or, or no I am happy to share these with everyone. Okay. Yes, absolutely. If you if you could put it in the chat here on the Zoom, then yeah. I can create a few only that we'll share with the group. Um, okay. So I'll give you just a minute to do that. Um, and again, we're we're parking ourselves here in unit um, uh, unit three out of the nine. And you had said earlier that unit three is really critical. Acids and bases in units eight is a pain point for a lot of people. Who had trauma in the in the chat, but that's a great place as well. <laughs> Everyone, I'm going to be sharing this chat, uh, this uh, this slide deck, and linking it out. So even if you don't have um, access to it, um, don't um, don't worry. Or if we don't cover everything, we'll have a chance to do this. I did want to also just take one moment, and briefly say, Corinne, your chem with Corinne at TikTok um, page, which I'm going to link to in the um, uh, the YouTube chat here, is also a great place to study. So without further ado, I'll shut up. I'll hand it over to you. Topic You're good. two: two properties of solids. Thank you. Yeah, and my TikTok's a good place to commiserate, right? <laughs> About some of the 
um, horrors, as you all have said, about AKB chemistry. Um, it's a great class. You should be proud of getting, you know, making it through this year. And I'm sure you have learned so much more chemistry than you are even aware of, but I'll hit on that at the end. Um, so this is just some vocab associated with unit three. Be careful with covalent network solids. Um, we tend to see this in there. So know that silicon dioxide is one of these examples where we have a covalently bonded molecule that's gonna form a crystal lattice. So different from what you'd expect. Normally we'll only see that crystal lattice with an ionic solid. Um, so this is just showing the differences um, between solids, liquids, and gases. Again, if you know the basics of chemistry, a lot of times that's enough to guarantee a three. Um, so make sure you're spending some time looking through these basics because as John mentioned, this unit is worth 22% of the exam because it ties into everything. Um, all right, connecting back to intermolecular forces and understanding how all of these um, interactions between molecules are related to all of these topics. So just be careful with that. The other thing you see in unit three is the ideal gas law. So here are, you know, introducing all of those um, equations that you're going to see on your equation sheet. But if you don't know what the variables represent, you're kind of stuck, right? So make sure you spend some time understanding what each of these represents. Um, and what I always recommend to my students is focus on the constants that you're given. The constants are going to have units attached to them, which you can then use to make sure that all of your other variables match up with that. So let's say you're trying to solve for the temperature, but you have no idea what your units are going to be. Look back at your ideal gas constant. If it's, if it's given in Kelvin, that's what your temperature is also going to be measured in. So always use your constants to help you try to sort through these equations. Um, so this is the ideal gas constant. You are most likely to use this version, um, which is the 0 0.08206 liters per atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Um, and with these gas laws, you're going to be using Kelvin. So make sure you know that conversion, right? Just adding 273 to the temperature in Celsius. Um, and with these, the easiest mistake to make and the most common mistake is just doing a simple algebraic error. So you have your calculator for the entire test. Make sure you're taking the time to write these in. I recommend rearranging the formula first, plugging everything in, writing it down, taking the 30 seconds to write it down before you then plug it into your calculator, just so you don't make a silly mistake. Um, all right. So the other thing we see um, are just everything you need to know about ideal gases. So an ideal gas, we're making some assumptions, right? No attractive or repulsive forces because essentially no intermolecular forces at all. Um, we're going to say they don't occupy a volume. They are moving completely randomly. And when they do collide, it's a completely elastic collision, which means no energy is transferred. So the question is, what? how do I know when something is not going to act like an ideal gas? And the easiest way to remember this is plight. So think low pressure, low ideal gas, high temperature. Okay, so this is when it's going to behave most ideally at low pressures and high temperatures. So when is it going to deviate most, right? Least ideal, the opposite. So high pressure, low temperature. So just think ideal plight, pressure low, ideal gas, high temperature. Um, the other thing you're going to see with gases is the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And with this, do not make this mistake. Do not look at the height of this peak and assume that this means more energy. Okay, look at the y-axis. Whenever you are looking at a given diagram on your exam tomorrow, take some time to look at each of these axes, right? That can give you a lot of information um, and make sure that you are approaching the problem correctly. So with this, the height of the peak tells you the number of particles moving at that speed. Okay, so just be very careful. And then each peak represents a given temperature. So the temperature of this blue section is always 100 Kelvin. So just be careful with this Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Um, the other thing you see in unit three are the calculations associated with solution chemistry. So the main formula you're going to use is molarity is equal to the moles of solute dissolved per liter of solution. You can then rearrange that molarity times volume equals moles. My high school chemistry teacher, I'm not going to tell you how many years ago, used to walk through the hallway saying, hey, you don't forget MV equals moles. It's not on your formula sheet, but that iteration of this equation will be one that you use tomorrow. Okay, so just remember molarity times volume equals moles. The other thing you'll need to know with solutions is the dilution equation. So the molarity times the volume of the initial solution is equal to the molarity times the volume of the diluted solution. Nice thing about that e equation, as long as both volumes are measured in milliliters, you don't have to convert back into liters. Um, so the other things in unit three, you have just some different separation techniques. Um, so know how things are separated according to each of these 
um, techniques. So distillation is based on boiling point, evaporation. You're removing a liquid by boiling it off, right? Filtration, it's separation based on particle size. And then chromatography is the big one. It's based on the particles attraction to the liquid or solid phase. So it's all about polarity. And that's whether you're looking at paper chromatography, which is probably a lab technique you have done, or you're looking at gas chromatography or liquid chromatography, one of those um, analytical techniques you've learned, but probably have not actually seen. Um, so just know that it's all based on polarity. Again, connecting into those intermolecular forces. So the thing you need to know with solubility is that similar things with similar intermolecular forces are going to be miscible or able to dissolve with in one another. Do not say like dissolves like. You can think it in your head. Don't tell anyone, but don't say that. Do not write that down. It's all about the degree of polarity and the presence of those intermolecular forces. That's going to determine what is soluble. Um, together, right? What is miscible? So miscible, just if you think miscible, mixable, okay? So if two substances are miscible, that means they're able to dissolve in one another. Um, let's see, I had something else about, okay, maybe I'll hit solubility in a little bit. Um, just tricks with solubility. If you need to remember what is soluble, focus on only what always dissolves. So focus group one, um, your ammoniums, NH4+, plus, your nitrates, those are always soluble. Don't get bogged down by trying to remember all of the different solubility rules. Just focus on what is guaranteed to be soluble, and that will help you find precipitates um, in your reactions. Um, we see spectroscopy. These equations, again, are pretty easy to use as long as you recognize what each of these variables represents. And again, these are given on your equation sheet. So just be careful not to make a simple algebraic error when you're rearranging it. Take the time to write it out, check your units, um, check your exponents. Um, don't make the mistake of dividing. If you end up with an answer that has 10 to the magnitude of the power of 40, you made a simple mistake. Okay, so be really careful with that. Um, the other law we see in this unit is the Beer Lambert law. This is just based on spectroscopy. It looks complicated, but it's just a matter of plugging everything in. So you should be given all of the ins, uh, um, all but one, right? So it's just a matter of making sure your units match up and just plugging and chugging. So don't let an equation that you maybe haven't seen in class slow you down, okay? Just use context clues. All right, unit four. I'm just going to go through this one really quickly because I anticipate this is not a difficult one and we'll hit more on a lot of these um, topics later. So you saw precipitation reaction. So writing out the net ionic, just focusing on the solid, um, making sure to include the right coefficients to create that solid. This is just a little stoichiometry chart to give you an idea of how to approach stoichiometry, whether you're working with a solution or a solid. It's all about getting to those moles to moles um, conversions, right? We cannot compare two substances on in terms of grams to grams. And look at this. I have something right here. All right, this is one mole of salt versus one mole of copper. They look very different, right? So you need to make sure that you have masses do not matter with this, right? You have to convert everything into moles, then you can use your coefficients. Um, after that, you can then multiply by molar mass or molarity to then change back into your um, mass or your liters, your volume. These are the different types of reactions introduced. Um, oh, here are the solubility rules, because this is what I was trying to um, talk through here. So again, you're not required to memorize solubility. You might be asked to solve for the KSP. We'll do an example with that. Let me switch gears and go to unit eight. Um, all right, so acid-base neutralization, we'll come back to that. Um, we'll come back to redox too. So let's continue on. So kinetics, kinetics is all about rates. Sorry, I'm moving on to unit five here. Um, so kinetics is all about rates. Be careful with this. Th those exp exponents do not relate back to the coefficients. So you'll, in order to determine that rate law, you have to be given experimental data. You hold one thing constant, right? And see how that changes your rate. And then you can solve for your um, rate. So according to each of your reactants. Um, let's see, this is the other thing you should be aware of. So note that you can identify the order of a reaction just by determining which curve is linear, right? So if you have the concentration over time and that is linear, that is a zero order reaction. The natural log of the concentration over time is linear, that's first order, and then one over the concentration that indicates a second order reaction. So if you were asked, if you're given four graphs and asked to um, determine the rate order, just look for the one that is linear. If you have these three, three things memorized, you can, you can breeze right through unit five. Um, let's see. So let's go on to unit six. Should I stop? Are there any questions coming up? I can't see uh, the chat. 
No, we're doing great here, everyone. Just as a quick uh, reminder, um, we're at 836 Eastern. We're flying through AP Chem. I just did a whole year long course. I'm going to get a five tomorrow because of this. Um, and <laughs> um, look, at, yeah, there's some people who are going to study after the exam, it looks like. Um, remember, if you're just, just joining us, I'm John from Marker Learning. This is Corinne from Chem with Corinne. We are reviewing a quick overview of the entire AP Chem course. There's a lot of great reviews um, available on, on uh, Corinne's uh, TikTok page. I also want to encourage you um, <clears throat> that as we go through this, keep posting the questions that you've got. We're happy to, um, to answer them as we go through the session tonight. Remember that you're not going to transform your entire experience of the AP exams the night before the test, right? So Corinne, just briefly, is there, as just in the middle here, is there a moment, you know, what, what is the advice you're giving your students about how to kind of calm themselves and trust themselves going into test day tomorrow? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's on my last slide. I don't think I'm going to get to slide 171 tonight, though. Um, you need sleep, right? At this point, sleep is more important than studying all night. Um, I always encourage my students, especially for a noon exam, you need to eat well tomorrow. You need to take some time. I would get to your testing center, with, whether that's at your regular school or that's somewhere else, get there a little bit early and take some time just to decompress with your classmates. You know, laugh a little bit about some of the things you have endured, um, but also just understand that you're going into this with such a great background, um, despite what it feels like, right? It is, this is an overwhelming course as all APs are. Um, you're not expected to know everything, but just trust in the basics that you have learned um, and everything, all of the experiences you have had this year. I don't know if that, that covers it. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, Corinne, I'm going to have everyone, this is corny, but we're going to do it. Everyone go to the chat right now and you're going to type into the chat. I'm going to trust myself tomorrow. Literally, I'm going to trust myself. That's one word tomorrow. <laughs> and I want to see the chat light up with this because it's one of those things that like People, it's amazing. AP students think they have to be perfect when perfection is not the standard. They have to think that they have to like conjure up all this kind of level of skill that they're not actually being assessed to. To get a four or five on this exam, you don't need to be perfect. In fact, what percentage do you really need on the multiple choice to get a four or a five tomorrow? Five, 72%. So a C minus. So yeah. everyone, I should make if everyone type that in the chat. I'm going to get a C minus tomorrow and do great. So I'm just taking a pause Hi. real quick to remind everyone of this, because um, we can spend some time here in Thermo, we'll spend some time, maybe we can finish in, in unit eight. Base, um, yeah. And, and yeah, I'll turn it back over to you, but you're all gonna trust yourself tomorrow. If you like this video, go ahead and press that like button. Stay with us here at Marco Learning. We've got live reviews in more than a dozen subjects. Corinne, I'll turn it back to you and we'll keep learning about unit six. All right, awesome. All right, so unit six, everyone's been asking about Thermo. Um, and just, I think because of the, the different equations associated with thermo. So know the basics, right? Endo, an endothermic reaction is where we're gaining heat by the system. It's going to be listed as reactant versus exo heat as lost, released to the surroundings as a product. Um, the other thing to know associated with that is just the energy diagrams. Um, understand that the difference between the reactants and products is where you have the enthalpy versus the difference from the reactants to the height of our peak. That is the activation energy. Um, so just be careful with that. These are just some of the definitions. Specific heat capacity is something you need to be aware of. It's the amount of energy required to change the temperature of one gram of a substance, one degree Celsius. So note that these are specific based not only on the identity of the substance, but also the phase it's in. So liquid water versus solid water as ice, they're going to have two very different specific heat values. So with the heat transfer equation, Q equals MC delta T. Again, use those, those units associated with your constant, your specific heat value um, to figure out the rest of this problem. Um, be careful with delta T. Delta, that triangle just indicates a change, right? So we're looking at the final temperature minus the initial. Um, and then the thing that everybody up is that there are so many different ways to refer to what's going on. So calorimetry, this idea that um, we're just assuming conservation of energy, right? So the heat lost by something is equal to the heat gained by either the water. So let's say we're mixing two solutions um, or we're, we're taking a hot piece of metal, dropping it into the water. These are just some of the different ways to refer to that. But essentially you're gonna take that heat transfer equation, make them equal and opposite to each other and then solve for your missing variable. Um, another, in, another situation where you gotta be careful not to make just a simple algebraic error. Um, let's see, let's look at this sample problem here. So I would like to hear um, what you all think for this one kind of reason your way through it. So let's say a, a student's doing a coffee cup calorimeter experiment. Hopefully a lot of you have done this in class. Um, the student failed to put the top on the cup. 
you know, these are not great systems anyway, some heat is going to be lost. So how is this going to affect the calculated value for the specific heat or C of the metal? Um, so I'd like to know just kind of what you all think, What what is your first guess? And with problems like this, where you're asked to think about an experimental error, it is okay to plug in arbitrary values. So say that the heat, the, if we look through this, we say, okay, some heat is going to be lost, right? So that means that our delta T is going to be smaller. So if delta T decreases, then Q is also going to decrease. So we'd anticipate that our specific heat is also going to be too small um, due to the heat lost. So don't be afraid to actually put numbers in it if you are a numbers person and that helps you to reason your way through problems like this. Um, you will see heat of fusion versus heat of vaporization. Note that the heat of vaporization, the energy associated with um, changing from the liquid to the gas phase, um, is going to be significantly higher than the other one. Okay, awesome. So I, I heard that everyone was guessing B, so that's awesome. All right, enthalpy. With enthalpy, I like showing bond enthalpies first because they are the opposite of everything else. So the um, delta H of the reaction, right? Sorry, sorry the um, bond enthalpy of the reaction is equal to the bonds broken minus the bonds formed. So essentially the reactants minus the products. And this is a common misconception. It takes energy to break those bonds and it frees to form them. Okay, so at breaking those initial bonds is an endothermic reaction versus creating the new ones is going to release energy that's going to be exothermic. We think about the strength of those bonds. Triple bonds are going to be the strongest because they're shorter. Okay, So short, strong, as we switch to double, they get slightly longer. And then single bonds are going to be our longest and our least strong. Um, the higher the bond enthalpy, the stronger that bond, the more energy that's going to be required to break it. The other thing we see with enthalpies is just this standard equation. Okay, So if we are just trying to find the enthalpy of formation, it's going to be equal to the sum of the products minus the reactants, noting that pure elements are going to have um, a heat of formation of zero because that's already the way they want to be, right? It doesn't take any energy for them to be in their elemental form. So this is just an overview of all of those thermal equations. Note that whether we're looking at enthalpy, entropy, or Gibbs free energy, the ones that you'll see in unit nine, it's always products, the sum of the products minus the reactants versus bond enthalpies. Be careful. That's essentially the reactants minus the products. Other thing you want to know is just the th what is thermodynamic favorable. We're talking about Gibbs free energy or delta G of less than zero. Um, our cell potential of greater than zero and our um, equilibrium constant of greater than one. All right, Hess's law. We're just solving puzzles here. Be careful with that. If you flip the sign, you're flipping the sign of H. If you use a coefficient, you're multiplying. All right, let's do another sample problem. I like to do this one, um, another one from last year's test, because a lot of students haven't there isn't an equation associated with this, but this is one of those instances where you can use the units to solve the problem. All right, so we're given the heat of vaporization um, for nitrogen trichloride in kilojoules per mole. We're asked to calculate the amount of energy required to vaporize a 15 gram sample, um, and we're given the molar mass. If you are given the molar mass, guess what? You are doing a molar mass conversion. So here I'm going from grams to moles. I'm going to divide by that molar mass to find out I have 0.125 moles um, of my substance. And then I'm just trying to figure out the amount of energy required for that um, amount. So I'm, well, if I know it, it releases 32.9 kilojoules per one mole. I only have 0.125 moles. I am just multiplying these two together. And then here's another example of sig figs. Um, we have three sig figs with this answer to match up all of our values. Um, noting that anything from the periodic table, we assume that has infinite sig figs. And your sig figs always want to match the value that has the least amount of sig figs. So your least precise value, the one with the fewest amount of sig figs, is the one that you want your answer to match with. All right, so let's move on. Um, equilibrium is a big one to so know the difference between reaction quotient and equilibrium expression. Um, reaction quotient is just any time other than at equilibrium versus equilibrium expression at equilibrium. Um, ice tables, ice tables, ice tables, ice tables. You will absolutely need to do these um, in with this and both with, in with acid-base chemistry. So let's spend a, a second with this. So initial change versus equilibrium. And I think I have an example here. So we just have um, a sample reaction here, A plus B yields C, and we wanna figure out the equilibrium concentration for C. So we're gonna set this up. We have our initial concentrations. Um, that's our first row. Um, our product, we assume that has a concentration of zero. And then our change, we're just going to use the stoichiometric coefficients here. So I'm going to subtract x from each of my reactants. I don't know what's going on with my, my 
<laughs> animation, sorry. And I'm gonna add two X to my product. Now it's a matter of solving that. I have my equilibrium expression. So let's go through that really quickly. Your equilibrium expression is going to be equal to the concentration of products raised to the power of their coefficients divided by the concentration of the reactants. You can also use partial pressures, right, if, for gases. So we're just plugging all of what we're given in, solving for X, a little bit of algebra here. Um, and then you have to go back to your initial problem and see that it's not just about solving for X, it's finding that equilibrium concentration. Um, so here we just have to multiply that by two to get our final answer. So that's ice in like two minutes, maybe. Um, other big thing from unit seven is Le Chatelier's principle. Concentration, easy. Pressure, pretty easy, right? So pressure, we're gonna shift to the side with more moles if the pressure decreases. Pressure increases, we're gonna shift to the side with fewer moles of gas. If there's no difference, pressure doesn't impact the system. With temperature, you want to think about heat as either a reactant or a product. So if, for example, endothermic reaction, it is a reactant. So we're going to favor the product side if we increase the temperature. Um, if we do the opposite, we're going to favor the reactant side. So it's just this idea that a system at equilibrium is going to act to minimize that change. Okay, so if we are increasing any reactant, we're going to form more products. If we are decreasing the amount of reactants, we're going to make more of those reactants. Note that catalysts do not impact equilibrium and only temperature is going to impact um, that um, equilibrium constant. All right, I think I'm ready to go to unit eight. Let's see how much time do we have? All right, <laughs> we'll see if we can do it um, in five minutes. This is KSP, another tricky topic. Um, let's see. So with KSP, if you memorize the um, KSP is based on the number of ions you're set, then you just solve for S. Um, using those equilibrium expressions. So these are the different expressions. And again, this, this uh, whole presentation will be linked for you all, so you can go through it as well. All right, let's go on to acid-base chemistry. Let's see here. I had too much fun putting in animations, I guess. All right, let's do some weak acid-base equilibria. Let's talk titrations too. So identifying the acid base, just looking for the movement of that H ion, right? What loses versus what gains an H, that's going to tell you your acid versus your base. Your acid becomes your conjugate base, your base becomes your conjugate acid. All about the movement of that proton or H plus ion. All right, so when we are thinking about acid base, uh, all right, so equations with pH and pOH, note that these bolded ones are not on your equation sheet and I'll show a slide that has all the ones that are not on your equation sheet so you can write those down. Um, and have those in your memory bank for tomorrow. So you don't have to move log functions around on your chemistry exam, at least. We'll save that for your math exams. Um, all right, so weak acid-base equilibria. Um, weak acids, HA, are gonna react with water, forming hydronium, that H3O plus, and the conjugate base. Okay, so if I set up my equilibrium expression, it's gonna be the concentration of my H3O plus compared to my conjugate base, right, times my conjugate base divided by my weak acid. If I want to find my percent ionization, because a weak acid is only going to partially ionize, I'm gonna look for my H plus or H3O plus concentration at equilibrium compared to my initial concentration of the weak acid. Just trying to see how much of that weak acid actually dissociated in solution. And yes, you have to use an ice chart with this. Um, those ice charts are definitely valuable. So keep those in mind tomorrow. Um, the other thing associated with this are just buffers. Okay, so buffers can be a combination of a weak acid and its conjugate base or a weak base and its conjugate acid. Um, it is never going to be a strong acid or plus a strong base. Okay, so weak acid and its conjugate base or weak base and its conjugate acid. And the system is going to resist changes to a pH, its pH to a certain extent. So let's talk about how this actually works. So you can see this, and I have a video um, on my one minute tutorials page to help you through this so you can kind of visualize it. So basically the conjugate base is going to react with a strong acid, creating more of our weak acid. So in this case, I had a one-to-one -one ratio of weak acid to conjugate base. So I could neutralize a set amount um, of each before I reach that buffer capacity. When it comes to buffer capacity, it's based on the concentration of the acid base in their conjugate pairs. So the higher the concentration, the higher the buffer capacity, the more that buffer can withstand the pH before that strong acid, strong base takes over. All right, titrations, let's see. 850, can I have five five more? I mean, do this in five minutes. Um, five I'm gonna minutes, show you three yeah. different titrations. Okay, three different titration curves. You will absolutely see one of these at least. Um, know the difference between these. So strong acid, strong base looks kind of like an S. You're only gonna have an equivalence point where your pH is at seven because you have neutralized um, the species, right? So you have, um, your moles of acid, moles of base are going to be equal at this point. Um, strong acids versus strong bases, know the seven strong acids, know that HF 
um, is not a strong acid. That always comes up too. Um, at looking at the other types of curves, so your weak acid plus strong base or your weak base, strong acid. With these, you'll see the curve looks slightly different because you have that half equivalence point. Remember that at the half equivalence point, your pH equals your pKa. That will save you um, a few headaches tomorrow. So remember at that half equivalence point, what we call the buffer zone, um, your pH is equal to your pKa. Your equivalence point is still going to be at the midpoint of the vertical portion of the curve. Um, and with a strong base weak acid curve, it's going to be slightly basic. With a weak base strong acid, it's going to be slightly acidic. Okay, so it all relates back to what you're working with here. So looking at this example problem, we have a 25 milliliter sample of hydrofluoric acid, which I just told you is a weak acid. Say it in your head right now. Hydrofluoric acid is a weak acid, which means it's not going to fully dissociate, right? It's not going to fully separate. So I am reacting that with 0.3 molar sodium hydroxide, a strong base, because our group one and group two bases are our strong bases. At the equivalence point, what would be the pH of the solution? So weak acid, strong base, we know it's going to be slightly basic. pH is going to be slightly above seven. And there are your seven strong acids and your strong bases. So make sure you have those memorized. Titrations. Um, you will probably see this on the FRQ. Um, you'll either be asked to analyze, um, just take a volume reading, or you'll be asked to look at one of the graphs um, or both, right? Um, so with this, just remember, always estimating one digit past the smallest marking when you're looking at any piece of glassware. doesn't matter what your second digit here is um, as long as your other digits are correct. So as long as you estimate, you will get full credit on this. Um, also, burettes, read backwards. So be careful with that. Even if you haven't had a chance to work with them in class, just look at the volume, take your time, um, and do the simple math there. So this one is just a simple uh, sample of the FRQ um, associated with the titration. So with this one, we're given the concentration. We know that the endpoint has been reached, so we can use MV equals moles to calculate our moles. So we use our given molarity. We multiply that by the volume that we just found in the previous question to figure out our moles um, that they are asking for. So the moles of permanganate here. All right, uh, let's see. So Unit nine, I'm just going to move forward. You will see this and give you guys those equations that you will not see on your equation sheet. And they're they're all just related to um, the other ones that the other ones that are on the sheet. It's just sometimes it's easier to have them um, written in other forms so you don't have to rearrange them tomorrow. All right, these are the equations associated with electrochemistry. Spend some time looking at these electrochemical cells. I might hop on TikTok and cover that again, just to help you all out. But these are the equations I'm talking about that are not on the sheet. I think I've covered all of these except for the molar mass one. So molar mass equals DRT. So the density times the ideal gas constant times T divided by the pressure. Um, a lot of people remember this as dirt. You put dirt over people. That's not a great way, but that's what everyone <laughs> recommends. Um, the other one we did not cover is just the equilibrium expression. Um, this is just a rearranged equation associated, you know, delta, delta G equals negative RT ln of K. This is another way to look at that. Um, let's see, and my advice for you tomorrow, sleep is more important at this point. It's almost 9 p.m. You should be considering going to bed soon. Don't forget to eat tomorrow, get to your test site early, have fun um, with your friends, and mention Columbic Attraction. This is a joke, but uh, really you should mention it. All right, and then my last piece of advice for you is that, remember, the score does not define you or your experiences in APCAM. Be proud of everything you have put in to get to this point. Be proud of all of the chemistry that you have learned and recognize that you are setting yourself up um, for success later on, whether you're going to take another chemistry class or not. Um, and that is what I have for you. I hope everyone has a good day tomorrow and just, you know, be excited that tomorrow's point we do the AP exam at least, and maybe the AP Gov exam if you have that double too. Well, thank you so much, Corinne. This was so incredible. Everyone, let's give a round of applause to Corinne in the chat and press that like button in honor of the, well, it's 500 of you here who've been able to cram for this event. Um, live with us. Really incredible and really exciting. One of the things you mentioned is your TikTok page. And in fact, if you could stop sharing for just a second, I'm going to share your Absolutely. page real quick, Corinne, because I want to show people what this awesome page is. It's called Chem with Corinne. <laughs> 
Um, it's there's reviews on, on all sorts of units. There's also your links page here, which has got tons of um, review notes and 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 tools. I have posted the link to this slide deck here in the in the description of this video, the very video that we're in. I want to encourage you if you um, are going to be studying chemistry, will you in fact, uh, Corinne, be able to go live on your TikTok for just a few minutes and say I continue yes. the conversation? Yep, so everyone, absolutely. let's do. Oh, go ahead. Oh no. Yeah. So let's do that. Let's everyone, let's head over to TikTok. If you're on TikTok and you can let me know in the chat um, and, um, and keep the conversation going. We can spend a little bit of time on unit nine, but look at all the, the comments in this chat about how everyone's going to do well. Everyone's got hearts and rounds of applause for you, Corinne. Thank you for all your incredible hard work. Um, with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up our session um, here. Thank you for coming and, um, and best of luck everyone on the exam tomorrow. Yeah, thank you, everyone, Thanks, everyone. and good luck. You've got this. Night.